So machine platform crowd. So that's what we're up to next. And uh, we have two of the young stars of the, uh, of the crowd economy. Uh, Anthony Goldblum, uh, who's a co-founder, CEO of uh, Kaggle, uh, recently purchased by Google, who you may have also heard of. I think their new combined company rumors are, I don't know whether it's going to be called Kugel or Kaggle. Or, <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. Um, and uh, Leah Busk, uh, founder of sort of the poster child of the sharing economy, Task Rabbit, raised $50 million. And uh, has been named on a number of lists of the most innovative uh, people in the economy. So please uh, join Leah and Anthony. Thanks. So um, let's start off just by understanding a little bit more about what each of your companies does and, and, and how it leverages the crowd. Um, why don't we start with, with you, Leah, and, and tell us a little bit about. Task Rabbit, and maybe there's a lot of people in the audience that have used it, but maybe a lot of who, others who haven't. Great. Um, so Task Rabbit was started in Boston. I'm a Boston native, and it was back in 2008. So at a time where uh, the mobile phone, the iPhone, had just come out, there was no app store, no one was using location-based awareness. But I am a technologist, and I became really passionate about how to mash up three technologies that were emerging: social location and mobile technology to connect real people in the real world to get real things done. In the last couple of years, it's become in real time, which is an entirely another dimension. But basically, you can go on task. What do you mean by real time? Wasn't it? Like instant, okay. instant connection. Like, yeah, I want someone to wash my car right now. Right now. Like yeah. okay. drop everything you're doing and come right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a whole other dimension to the business. But um, basically, you can go on, and if you need uh, someone to wash your car, or uh, handyman services is a large category for us, furniture assembly, moving help, uh, personal assistance. You can find someone in your neighborhood, in your community, that you can hire to do those jobs. Great. And Anthony, you're a pretty different kind of business. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Kaggle. I was, I was thinking uh, th this is kind of an interesting, two di very different ends of the, the crowd spectrum. So. Um, uh, what Kaggle's best known for, so we're a machine learning crowd, uh, and so what we're best known for is companies will post problems on our website, and we have a community of actually just past a million uh, data scientists and machine learners who are signed up to our community who will tackle these problems. So to give you some uh, real-world examples, we have a prize on the site at the moment uh, posted by Zillow where the, uh, this is to improve this estimate algorithm and the winning... Uh, estimate of a house value. Yeah, the, the, the house valuation algorithm. And the winner wins uh, just over a million dollars. Uh, a couple of months ago, we closed a competition, another million dollar competition to take CT scans uh, and try and diagnose lung cancer. So uh, these are people from all over the world, um, you know, a lot, lot in North America, but a lot of the strongest community How members. How many people will enter one of those contests? Um, so the Zillow competition uh, launched maybe two weeks ago, uh, maybe three weeks ago. It has about 1,000 in it. Mm -hmm. um, we've had up to 5,000 teams enter these competitions. So it's, and very few win prize money. So in most cases, uh, people are uh, motivated to participate in order to learn. And we have become a credential. So a lot of very elite, you know, whether it be DeepMind or OpenAI or elite machine learning employers, you know, that, if you, get, if you don't get an MIT degree, an alternative is to compete on Kaggle, do very well, and you will find. <laughs> you get your Kaggle ranking. You get your Kaggle so, ranking. So yeah. despite the million dollar prize is kind of, that's an unusually large prize, right? A lot of them are much, much smaller. H historically, yes. So um, before this year, the largest prize that we ever paid was 500,000 followed by 250,000. This year, we have launched $2 million prizes and we're hopefully, fingers crossed, you may see another one coming up this week. And it's very interesting because I think this is a reflection on what Kaggle started seven years ago and machine learning was not really a big topic. Um, it was, it was kind of this little niche thing. Uh, Kaggle was built as a website that I wanted to exist in the world. I wanted to compete in these machine learning co competitions. So it wasn't, there wasn't a great business vision behind it. We sort of grow. Uh, machine learning is now, um, it, it's becoming a, a really big thing, and, and that's pushing prize points Machine learning is part of it, but also tapping into the, the crowd. And, and it was, you, you said, you mentioned that it, actually despite that million dollar prize, that's not really the, the biggest motivation for most of the people joining? I, I would say that if you are smart enough to win the million dollar prize, um, 
you should uh, you should probably you can make good money in other ways. You should probably build algorithms to trade the stock market or something because our competitions are popular, so popular now that actually the difference between first and twentieth is often not statistically significantly different. And so if you picked a different random seed, you might have finished first versus twentieth. So mm -hmm. it's it's just because the yeah the top. Uh, the scores that people get on the top of our leaderboard are all like within very, very you know, people converge on about the same level. So those other people get nothing? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we, the, but they still do it. They still, you obviously get lots and lots of people joining. They, they, they may not get uh, the million dollar prize, but they'll almost certainly get a job offer from some elite employer. And um, then do they ever come back? Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's a little bit of a um, it's a bit, some of the very elite employers uh, actually I think this was the case this has been the case with Google and we're working to change this Google will not let people they don't want people competing in that <laughs> so much visibility okay well the motivations are pretty different at, at TaskRabbit I imagine they're not doing it just for the glory of getting that job T tell us about about what kinds of people are what kinds of people are are you know why are people signing up for TaskRabbit both, on both sides of the market. Yeah. So, um, you know, I founded the company back in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a very different time. I quit my cushy job as a programmer at IBM um, to build the first version of the site. I got it launched in September of mm -hmm. 2008 which uh, was a very scary time, right, financially. Mm -hmm. The stock market was crashing, people were being laid off. Mm -hmm. I had just left this, this great career. Mm -hmm. uh, what I realized, <laughs> what's that? You just decided to leave in the middle of the recession? Well, I quit my job in, um, it was April of mm -hmm. 2008. Okay. Yeah, just a few months before yeah, that. Okay. Uh, I locked myself in my house for about 10 weeks straight to code the mm -hmm. first version of the site, and then I got it launched in Boston in September. Um, what I realized was, even though for me it was a scary time to be launching a company, it was a really um, compelling time uh, to launch a company like this because there were so many people looking for new ways of working. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could say this was something I had foreseen. Oh, <laughs> I so, did there, not. so a lot of people who now were looking for, for new ways to make income, That's right. you provided a way for them to do that. Yeah, and these were uh, teacher, teachers that had been laid off, pharmacists, lawyers, um, you know, white collar jobs that all of a sudden weren't as readily available any longer, but these people had amazing skills. And so mm -hmm. when we started the community, it was more about what sort of skills do you have that you can offer? And some of it um, was, you know, help me update my resume or help me create this PowerPoint presentation. Other things were help me, uh, you know, mount some shelves on a wall. It was a real wide range. It's a very, yeah, exactly. I was going to say, so, so diverse. Yes. How did people, did you get, did you need to have critical mass in some of these verticals before people was, know to go? Yeah, it was hard um, early on because uh, when you said uh, you can post anything to get done on Task Rabbit, what would you post? People's minds would go blank. They had no idea what to use it for. And so over time, we really had to start honing in our what are the key verticals, what are the key categories that we want to double down in. Did you have a specific idea of what you thought it was going to be initially? Um, I always, I had an inclination that it would be around home services. And this is why. There is such a massive trust barrier when you think about inviting a person into your home, a stranger into your home. Mm -hmm. And back in 2008 and 2009, there was no Lyft, there was no Uber. The thought of getting into a stranger's car was completely insane. Right. And so um, I foresaw, though, that leveraging things like the social graph with Facebook, location awareness, these would all bring more trust to a community and bring more trust to a network. So the idea was, how can we create a service platform on top of these trust platforms? Mm -hmm. And I thought home services is going to be really key because how many people are you really going to let into your home? Mm -hmm. So much so that the initial site that I launched in Boston was with a closed community, the Charlestown Mothers Organization. If anyone lives in Charlestown, I lived there for eight years. One square mile of Boston, 800 moms. And I thought, moms are busy. <laughs> they need a lot done around the house. And there's a high trust. You had to be to in that community to be able to be on it. That's right. That's right. And very early on, we did all the vetting and the background checking, and that was a core piece of the platform as well. Did you have a reputation system? That we did. You yeah, did from or the did very not? beginning, yeah, we did. did. Yeah. yeah, we did. And you know, the at the time, the vision was. Uh, eBay, you know, was very popular for goods. We can be the eBay for services. And so at that time, the product was this auction bidding-based model with a whole reputation mm -hmm. engine as well. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, what, what motivated you to go to the 
crowded to think that all these people out there across the planet would be able to contribute to machine learning? And were there some key technologies or insights that, that made it possible for you to do that now versus, I don't know, 20 years ago? So, so I would say my, my story was actually a bit more born out of frustration, as, as you can probably tell. Um, I have an Australian accent, so I'm from Australia. wasn't um, sort of very deeply embedded in the tech scene. Um, I actually have a global financial-related start to Kaggle uh, as well, although a slightly different one. Um, in 2008, seven, I was working at the Australian Treasury, and one of the things I was working on, I was a statistical modeler. I was working on mm -hmm. um, modeling out sub the impact of subprime mortgages, and noticed at the bottom of The Economist magazine, they hosted an essay competition. If you won, you won an internship, and so I entered in 2007 with an article about why the up tick in subprime mortgage defaults wasn't going to be a problem. I don't know what all the fuss is about. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they judged the um, article, I think, just a bit before April when Bear Stearns collapsed. And uh, so I won the uh, essay competition. I pitched a piece to my editor about... <laughs> <laughs> so now lucky. we know who to blame. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was very lucky. Um, so, so I pitched a piece to my editor about predictive modeling. Um, and, you know, as a statistician, it was a topic that was, was interesting to me. Um, and it was really great. I could call anyone up and I could say, hi, it's Anthony Goldblum from The Economist. I'd like to interview XYZ. I didn't say I was an intern. I, so people would take the call. Um, and it turned, you know, I got access to people I wouldn't ordinarily get access to. And I was in, in, you know, in asking them about their predictive modeling competitions. Predictive modeling was the buzzword then, not machine learning. Uh -huh. um, and so I, was, you know, I felt like I was a good programmer, a good statistician. If I had a chance on these problems, I'd do a nice job. But if I contacted the same people, not as Anthony from The Economist, but as somebody else, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. And so the whole idea um, behind Kaggle was to give people like me access to real world problems and people like, you know, pe people like the companies I was interviewing uh, access to people like me. That was uh, where the idea came from. And um, it was... Um, I, you know, it wasn't like there was clever market sizing or anything like that. It was really just something that I wanted to exist that I would have wanted to, to play with. To be able to reach those people you're calling as an economist, uh, economist yeah. writer, yeah. Got you. And, and what about the technology platform? Did you lock yourself in the room for 10 weeks and... Uh, yeah, well, um, I'm not as... Uh, I think Lee is a better coder than I am. Uh, it took me about six months, uh, <laughs> and I suspect actually Kaggle was simpler than TaskRabbit. Um, so, and, and actually, the, so, so I did code up the first version of Kaggle, and it went better than I, I, I could have hoped. I guess there were more people um, like me than I expected, and we got to the point where um, Kaggle was operating on a sort of, sort of single database, and it wasn't... It was... Um, kept adding indexes and it was falling apart and, and uh, had big problems. And fortunately, I had a, a, a better programmer uh, by the name of Jeff Mosier who, who rewrote the site that I took six months to write in one month. Uh, uh, but yeah, it started out as, as sort of a you know, not, not, not super well uh, engineered thing. And once it worked, we, we rewrote and it. And was it always sort of what it's doing now? Or did, you have, did it kind of evolve in terms of the kinds of problems that you're going after? So we're uh, most famous for machine learning competitions, um, and we have other services that we have, have layered in. Uh, but it's still, um, but the machine learning competitions piece is still, you know, very much intact. I would say that that's what it started. Except you called it predictive modeling. Yeah, it, it was called predictive modeling, and the nature of the problems people posted were very different. So they were typically structured data, much you know the kind of data. Give us some concrete examples. Um, so our first Fortune 500 customer that really helped put us on the map was with Allstate, trying to predict uh, who. Yes, based that on was a famous example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, based on historical claims who would crash their car. You know, quite a standard sort of a predictive modeling problem. Um, you compare that to the problems we're doing today. T tell us about the result. That was, I mean, so I, I used to teach that because it was so, so evocative. What exactly happened there? Give us the details about yeah. what they had before and then with you guys and, and how it changed. So in, in insurance, um, actuaries typically used uh, relatively simple techniques. So either, you know, looking at statistical distributions, sometimes they were using basic techniques like logistic regression. Um, there was a class of uh, techniques called um, uh, basically ensemble of decision trees, so gradient boosting machines and random forests that hadn't really made their way into insurance yet. Um, and these are extremely powerful techniques. But, but just to be clear, the problem, just the basic problem was predicting what 
they should charge for a particular car. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Based on somebody's um, hi history of claims, mm -hmm. how, you know, how likely they were to have a future claim, and therefore what what you should what, what you the should right charge. price should be. Um, and so, you know, actuaries worked in a certain. They had a t set of techniques. They and they've been doing this for decades. Yeah, um, with a similar set of techniques. And this and is the so bread and butter. This is the business that they've been. This is the core. Totally. And so we brought in a new set of techniques, and that gave them a lot of lift. Um, but it's interesting, so the biggest change I would say we've seen in Kaggle is the nature of the problems has really changed. Deep learning, uh, you know, 2012 was the big year for deep learning. But just to make the last, just a punch on that, you got a, what, a couple hundred percent? It was 270 percent lift. 270 percent improvement in accuracy yeah. over how many, how much time? Um, the winning algorithm, so the competition lasted three months. I would say we probably got the 270% lift within a couple of weeks. It, it was a couple of weeks. Some, very there were people out there who just had better algorithms that they had all these decades, they'd never tapped into them before. Yeah, and, and so two things are happening uh, during a competition. One is, as you say, people are coming to the problem with techniques that, different techniques that hadn't been used on, on insurance problems before. The other interesting thing, though, is there's this interesting dynamic with the leaderboard, right? So we show people in real time how they're performing relative to each other. And so what happens is, you know, somebody gets into the first place and they're doing a victory lap, they're very excited, um, but then somebody passes them. And whereas they might have ordinarily stopped, uh, they're now motivated to try and get ahead of that person. And they, they keep um, passing each other until you get to this point where there's, it's just, you cannot do better, right? Like there's, there's only so much signal in a data set and they've pushed each other to the point where they've extracted all the signal. Um, and so I always make the argument that if you're working in isolation without a leaderboard, you don't know where to stop. Um, but boy, when somebody's pa if you're anything like me, when somebody's passed you, you want to, you need to know what they found, and you need to. Like if you have like three successive panels, and each one wants to. Yeah, top yeah, right, one. right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope yeah. we're doing okay on that. I want to take some questions from the audience, see if the crowd can make the panel even better. Some questions, but um, before that, I want to ask uh, Leah a little bit about. So th there's different reasons that people might go out to the crowd. One is that people have better algorithms, techniques, there's somebody out there who knows something you don't. Another is just sort of arbitrage, you know, you are a, a busy lawyer or mom or whatever and you don't have time and you just want to like pay somebody else, mm -hmm. you could do it just as well. You know, there's the classic you know, uh, example economists give that Michael Jordan could probably mow his lawn faster than most people but it mm -hmm. still probably pays for him to hire someone else to mow his lawn. Mm -hmm. And so, so how important do you think those different motivations are? Are people looking for some kind of expertise out there or are they more just, you know, taking their time and trying to find someone else to, to take care of some tasks? Or, or, or how, would you, how would you balance those? It really, it really is a mix of both. And when we think about on the demand side, people that are posting tasks on TaskRabbit, there's a few different profiles. Mm -hmm. um, it is 60% women, um, so it skews female. Uh, in terms of posting clients. or to clients? Yep. Yeah, clients. Uh, okay. On the demand side, people posting tasks. Mm -hmm. um, on the supply side, it does skew male. Um, and so we find that a lot of times maybe someone doesn't have the right skill set to hang curtains or hang shelves or put together, has anyone tried to put together Ikea furniture? Like, yeah. I think Carl Bass. I mean, I, I do not have that skill set. Um, so it's a little bit of that, but there's also a big portion that's just save, save time, save money, you know, time is money and I need to be doing other things or I need to spend time with my kids or take them to school or whatever. What are some of the more unusual skills or tasks that women are asking men to do? <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. Um, <laughs> So we see a wide range of things that happen on TaskRabbit. Um, we see funny things like uh, someone was planning a birthday party and wanted um, uh, someone to come dressed up like a hot dog, like Frank, like it was a uh -huh. hot dog themed birthday party for uh -huh. their friend Frank. Um, <laughs> people get really creative. Gotcha. Wait, and, and did the client think of that or the... the uh person who Sometimes it's collaborative. I mean, a lot of times I've hired people before to help me plan a birthday party for my kids. Um, <laughs> these and ideas, I need yeah. ideas, right? And they're like, oh, hey, I saw this other person do this amazing thing and I could help here. Um, one of my favorite stories, though, was it happened in Chicago. And this woman um, accidentally dropped her keys in the lake and she needed to find them. So she went on TaskRabbit and she said, can any, anyone out there help me? The tasker that signed up for the job actually was a certified scuba diver oh. and came over in a scuba gear. <laughs> and he dove into the lake and he found those keys. Really? He did, yeah, wow. he did. And that, that's to this day one of my favorite stories. Yeah, that is a good story. Yeah. 
So let's take some questions. Who's got uh, questions from the crowd here? Uh, over there in the back, this one. Hi. Um, does, has anybody studied or have a hunch that the wisdom of the crowd comes from the depth of the labor pool or a different perspective because they're not in that industry or they're just smarter or something else? Um, so if I'm going to answer from the Kaggle's perspective, I think it's, as I said before, it's a combination of coming at a problem with a different perspective. So we take that Allstate example, and Allstate was using a certain set of techniques. People in our community had exposure to different techniques that hadn't made their way into actuarial science. So that's, it's kind of a cross-pollination type. They've got some, they're, they're uncorrelated. The people who have been working in it just keep doing the same thing yeah. over and over, and you've got somebody from left field who's more likely to have a different perspective. Totally, but that's only part of the story. And as I said, the, that leaderboard um, is really quite powerful in the Kaggle setting. Now, this does not generalize uh, very well. It just happens to be the case that statistical machine learning problems can be graded very objectively. Um, but you know, you look at, um, there's, there are design communities, like 99designs is an example, where they'll post a problem and designers will compete for the, uh, but you can't measure that objectively, right? People you know, post their different designs. Um, so it's, it, we happen to be lucky that we can exploit that, that, you know, that motivation through the leaderboard effect. Is, is part of it also, though, I think what Wes was getting at, that, is that there just seem to be a lot more hours put into it. I mean, if you've got yeah. with 1,000 people, I mean, maybe if the guy at Allstate had spent that many person hours, you know, they eventually would have improved it. Is, is, is this part of it just that, that you're getting, finding a way to get people to work harder than they otherwise would have? It's, it's interesting. So firstly, there's cumulatively an enormous number of hours, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let's say Z Zillow's um, uh, data science team wouldn't be 1,000. They've got 1,000 people working on this problem. But it's also interesting, this leaderboard effect also mm -hmm. causes people to spend more hours um, than mm -hmm. they might have otherwise. We also have a... Um, a platform where professors host competitions for their students. And the first class that ever did this was um, Stanford Stats 202 class, and the professor was Susan Holmes. Um, and Susan said, um, you know, we asked how that went. It was sort of an experiment. It was a product called Kaggle in class. We asked how it went, and Susan said, you know, the, the winning, the top team spent 100 hours on this uh, competition. I've never been able to get students to spend 100 hours on anything. <laughs> uh, you stick a leaderboard in front of them, and the, you know, the class kind of competitive dynamic um, made it a successful and we did, we'll do well over a thousand machine learning classes using Kaggle in class, like it's really taken off as an educational tool. Yeah. Great. Let's take another question, uh, oh, over here. So we work with uh, departments and municipal governments, in particular animal shelters. Is there any way to bring these new technologies new ways of thinking, new styles of work to our government, in particular municipals. Um, we work with county and city governments. And, you know, we're lucky if they're using client server technology. <laughs> um, I can share that um, a lot of um, cities across the globe, uh, as an example, the city of London, the mayor's office there, was very keen in bringing us, bringing TaskRabbit to that market um, sooner rather than later because he really saw the value in providing uh, this new way of working for the people in, in their community. Um, so I, I do think that there's an opportunity for the power of crowd to work with cities to figure out how to innovate these infrastructures that you know, haven't, haven't been rethought and reimagined in, in a long time. So in the city of London, if I understand, getting opportunities for people to work That's right. task rabbit. What about the other side, government getting people to do tasks? Are there, are there any of the kinds of tasks that you provide that you are your, your clients government organizations, or is well, that? Again, I would say we're really focused on the home services category, yep. so it tends to be more uh, individuals in and around their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, but but sure, they need to have something fixed or something? Yeah, of yeah. course. There are these one-off jobs that small businesses, um, uh, maybe some, some government uh, entities uh, utilize. Uh, a lot of people have IKEA furniture in their <laughs> offices. It's true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. OK, over here. How do you how do you handle data privacy issues with Kaggle, or do I get access to all of all states' data when I participate? Yeah, so d data privacy is obviously a, a big topic for us. Um, uh, if you look at the, so uh, we'll anonymize the data set. There are two issues, I guess, when it comes to data privacy. One is PII, so personally identifiable, inf 
identifiable information. The second sensitivity is around competitive intelligence. So uh, Allstate doesn't want their customers to, to get a sense. Um, there are different solutions that, depending on uh, which of those two issues that you're um, dealing with. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, pers personally identifiable uh, PII uh, side, what we do is we, um, we reduce the granularity of the data. Um, and so what we try and do is have no, well, what we do is we have no unique record in, in the data. So we'll have at least a match pair. So you can never sort of pin down that this is a particular individual. Now, in some cases, uh, in truth, that makes Kaggle, like you end up destroying information and you destroy so much information, actually you're better off not using us, right? Um, um, in the competitive intelligence um, uh, uh, area, it's actually a little bit simpler. Because what you can do is you can, in often cases, uh, do things like scale the data set. You can predict the residual from a model. Like, let's say you're trying to predict insurance claims. All state you know, have their existing model already. And this is actually what we did in that case. Um, and all we're trying to do is predict the residual, the things that the all state model didn't get right, in which case no one ever sees you know, the outcome. So that's, uh, and, and we're doing uh, something similar with Zillow, so that's a solution. I'll also say that one benefit um, for us in being, there are a bunch of benefits in us being part of Google, but Google has cutting edge research around data anonymization. And so whereas a small company, like that's very important to us as a small company, it's not something we can invest in, but we can draft off uh, other areas in Google. So this is actually an area where we have more capability now than we did pre-acquisition. Great. And so just raise your hand if you have another question. We'll, we'll take one more um, over here. Um, this is a question for Kago as well. So I have heard that Netflix had a contest for recommendations, but they didn't end up using the winning entry. Um, not sure why, but have you seen that in certain cases where the result is better, but it wasn't used? for some reason. Yeah, so um, first of all, I'd say customers have different motivations in um, uh, hosting competitions. So sometimes it's purely for benchmarking. So figuring out like what is what can be possible with machine learning without ever the intention to um, put into production. So there are reasons why that might be the case. So one example is um, insurance actually is very hard to get algorithms into new algorithms into production because uh, there are there's a regulator for each state. Uh, the regulators have to improve, have to approve the pricing schemes, and so very often the length of time between getting a new algorithm and getting it into production is quite a couple of years. By the time you've taken it through the, all the regulators, and so in a case like that, um, uh, the motivation can often be figuring out what's possible at the limits um, of. Uh, uh, machine learning, and then if, if the benefits are good enough, then you will go through the hassle of you know, getting the regulators on board. If the, if the benefits are not big enough, then you don't. Um, then, of course, there are uh, customers, a decent, you know, a decent percentage of our customers don't just want benchmarking. They want to get their models into production. Um, this is something that we have gotten better at over time. I would say that Kaggle competitions um, result in over-engineered models where people, you know, say in the first three weeks, and we talked about the Allstate example, the first few weeks, 99% of the gains are made. And then in order to get that last little bit, people are adding complexity onto the model that in, in practice, you don't really want when you're putting a model into production. You want the 99% uh, accurate model. And so what we... What we ask competition winners to do when they, uh, the, the, sorry, I should say the deliverable from a competition is code, documentation, and a screen share presentation. And when we ask for that deliverable, we also ask the winners to supply a simpler version of the model that uh, gets 99% of the final score. Because on the way to getting that, you know, the winning score, they had a simpler model. And so that way, the customer gets a choice between putting into production a simpler model or do some, of, do some of the contestants have an incentive maybe to hold back some of their secret sauce so that they can either get hired or win more contests? Or do you find that they're pretty open about saying, hey, this is the way I won the contest, and you know, anybody else can do it now, too? I, I, actually, in most cases, um, uh, people want to share. Like, they've done clever things, and they, they want to show off. Know it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so um, very often, we have a, a, quite a popular blog where it's, um, we have a series called How I Did It where when the customer will allow, uh, we will have the winners post a lot of their methods because um, that's a big motivation. You know, the, the 2,000 people who competed and didn't win want to know what the winner did uh, mm -hmm. so that next time uh, they're, you know, they're participating uh, in a competition, they can try some of the techniques that work. And um, the other thing I would add is very often um, the winning solutions are not that... Um, uh, not that generalizable. So even within insurance, we've worked with Allstate, Liberty Mutual, AXA, 
uh, AIG, you know, most of the large insurance companies, good industry for us. Um, it's not like you could take the Allstate algorithm and port it. Uh, the reason being is they have slightly different products, they have slightly different demographic of customer, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like knowing how the algorithm for Allstate works is terribly useful to anyone else anyway. It's really interesting how people are reaching outside the corporation, outside the home for, for help. Um, and, but, but jobs provide lots of uh, things. In, in addition, they provide some of the, in our United States, a lot of the social services. And so there's been this rise of the contingent workforce. You were telling me a little bit about, Leah, the, the rise of the contingent workforce. And say a little bit about how people on TaskRabbit or the other parts of the, that economy um, get benefits, you know, health, unemployment, whatever. How, how is that working? Yeah, so I mean a couple of things. One is about 10% of the taskers that are part of the community are doing this on a more full-time basis. They're picking up two to three jobs a day. They're cashing out upwards of you know $7,000 every month. Um, it's still a smaller portion of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of it is still very uh, flexible. Pop, people pop in, people pop out. Um, they have other jobs that they're doing as well. So they might be getting their health benefits from uh, a full-time job or part-time job elsewhere, yep. and then do this sort of for some supplemental income? Right, now that said, I do believe that there is there's probably a scenario where we decouple um, uh, things like benefits and 401k, um, uh, you know, and uh, we've even offered um, discounts to healthcare plans um, so from we, your employer. So we, TaskRabbit, you're helping some of those workers find their yeah, own. Yeah, I mean, I think I think people. Um, it doesn't have to be such a binary discussion, right? Yeah. If you're a 1099 contractor, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have, have access to these things. Right. I think it was, it was Alan Kruger. There, there was a proposal to uh, create a new category. You know, 1099. You're responsible for everything in your own. W2. Mm -hmm. Your employer has certain obligations to, to in the United States, take, take care right. of some of the benefits. Yep. And there has been some discussion. I'm not sure it's a good idea or not. Is to have a new category where. Um, Uber drivers, TaskRabbit, and others, this growing contingent workforce. Yeah, I mean, over 34% of Americans today consider themselves freelance workers. In the UK, it's about 14%. Those numbers are growing. So mm -hmm. there's clearly a trend here where people mm -hmm. want to take work into their own hands, but that means we need to rethink the infrastructure around work as well. Right. Let's take some more questions. And how about right here in the middle? Whoop. <laughs> Do you have the problem of like in a silent auction where la people want to put in their bids at the very last minute, do you have the same problem where the winning <clears throat> with the leaderboard, you see if you've got a better thing and they don't want to put their thing in yeah. until the end? It's funny. Um, we, we, we joke that there's this effect called the Roger Bannister effect after the guy who won the four minute mile, broke the four minute mile. You know, for 10 years, the world record was four minutes and one second, and then Roger Bannister broke it. And before long, everyone was breaking it. And we see a similar dynamic on Kaggle where you know, once you see a score is achievable, others almost, you know, might have been going along at this level for a while and others or, or almost immediately um, achieve it. And so you would think that that would lead to the strategy that you mentioned, which is sniping at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in reality, um, we have enough density of teams in our competitions now that somebody wants to see their name at the top of the leaderboard, at least for some period of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, um, even if there are people doing that, it ends up not being really a, such a good strategy because we just have so many teams in these competitions now that even if half of them are doing it, there are enough good, strong people who aren't that it doesn't happen. That, that leapfrogging, how much of that do you think is because just they know, okay, that four minute mile can be broken. So if they, yeah. versus they see an algorithm, they say, oh, I hadn't thought of using random forest. Why don't I mad that? And suddenly they all get that. That yeah, it's, it's all the Roger Bannister effect. So um, what happens is we have uh, forums where people share ideas, but they, no one ever shares their secret sauce. Um, uh, uh, so, um, so, and we have a code sharing tool called C Kaggle Kernels where people share some of their code, but no one ever shares their uh, secret source. So people share, you know, yeah, so it's really just this leaderboard effect. Once you see a, a really good score as possible, um, it, it makes, whereas if you were, at the top of the leaderboard, maybe you're trying small fine tuning. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but things. if somebody makes a big improvement, you're like, oh, there must be some other thing, and it makes you think harder. Yeah, that's exactly. really interesting. So you, that's you amazing. Try, you try bigger. You try bigger ideas when there's a when there's a big leap. Gotcha. How about over on this side? Uh, I think there's someone there in the corner. Oh, right, right here. Yeah, great. Uh, so uh, I, that's a question to Anthony. Uh, have you seen successful um, 
competitions where the study of the problem of the data set changes the, the data set nature, meaning that all the, all the things that you mentioned, people who are getting insurance from Allstate, they're not changing their behavior based on how Allstate is changing their pricing of their product. So where there's a feedback loop in the data, yeah. that's one and second where there's an overfeeding issue with the data, meaning that the data set itself, the dimensions of the data set are so small that if you start studying it with a ton of people, well, you find things that don't really exist there. How do you control for those? And have you seen successful competitions in there? Yeah, so I would say historically, so the first um, uh, part of your question, you were talking about what we would call an adversarial situation. So let's say you, uh, I think Patrick was talking about fraud. Fraud is a classic adversarial situation where you have an algorithm that detects fraud. The fraudsters sort of figure out how to reverse engineer the algorithm. They change their behavior, and then you change the fraud algorithm. And historically, Kaggle has not been very, um, a very good fit for, the, for adversarial problems uh, because um, we have, you know, a competition lasts three months. At the end of the three months, you put the algorithm into production, then people get around it, and then what you have to run, and it's good for our business, repeat business, but it's a pain for the customer, right? Um, we're actually, um, we, we have um, uh, innovated a little bit in the way we're running competitions, uh, where we now allow people to um, execute code. So we, you don't just, you, uh, the, the competition can be judged going into the future, and actually the, um, the Zillow competition is going to be judged like this, where um, actually the, the, uh, uh, the competition will be frozen in four months' time, and we will the algorithms will be continue to run uh, over the subsequent three months to see how well they predict house prices in reality. And so that ability to run code competitions where people are uploading their code and we can sort of feed in, you know, it allows us to host things with adversarial uh, situations. Um, overfitting is a huge issue uh, in machine learning. So uh, just to explain the term overfit, this is the second question. Over, just to explain the term overfitting, um, what can happen is you build an algorithm and it, it works amazingly when you try it on your training set and then you put it into production, all of a sudden it's not working very well. And so, so what you've done is you've overfit to the sample that, you know, the data you've trained it on. Um, and right. If the person's name is John Smith, then, yeah, say yes. If, and, 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 yeah. That's not really what you're trying to ask. No, you're not finding a real effect. You're overfitting. And it's very interesting. Kaggle has very robust uh, mechanisms for preventing against overfitting. So we'll give people feedback on a le live leaderboard. Actually, what we do is we throw that data set away. We retest them on a, on a second data set to make sure that uh, their performance um, sort of stays at that level. And it's actually very interesting. Um, we notice that the first time somebody competes in a Kaggle competition, it's extremely common, no matter how experienced they are, that on the public leaderboard, their position is better than on the private leaderboard. So they're not really protecting against overfitting. It makes me very, very worried because a lot of these people are building algorithms that are in production you know, in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And they've probably, they don't have this situation. We quarantine the, the test data set so they don't have access to it. But when they're writing their academic papers or they're you know, building an algorithm that detects fraud or credit scoring, they don't have that quarantining. And it makes me wonder how many of the world's algorithms are actually overfit. Um, so it's just an interesting, yeah. How about right here, a question? So you've seen a number of contests and a number of designs for contests. C could you talk some about how people design good contests versus bad and whether or not you need uh, data scientists for the design portion? Uh, um, so um, we have run a lot of contests. I would say that, um, for a con first of all, there's for, for, it, for it to be worth using Kaggle, the pr problem has to be sufficiently complex and sufficiently rich such that, you know, if it's a relatively easy problem, you know, in half a day people will get the best score and it's kind of boring and it fizzles. So that's one thing. Like, the problem has to be kind of rich enough that it merits a, a Kaggle competition. Um, other than that, I would say that, you know, one thing that I think um, has made Kaggle work quite well is that we're a nice... You need domain expertise and you need really good machine learning. And the role of domain expertise is to ask the right question, make sure it's being evaluated correctly, make sure the right data is being um, brought to the table. And that's all the stuff that happens in the design phase. Um, after the design phase is done, then it just gets tossed over the fence to our community who may know absolutely nothing about the domain, but they're really good with machine learning. And the problem is so well specified by the domain experts that it allows people who have that kind of raw machine learning capability to be productive on a problem when they have no domain expertise. So 
Um, and and the, the other thing I would say, you asked if a data science ne test needs to be involved. Um, you know, there, there was a question asked about municipal governments and whether you know, the, our sort of solutions are a good fit. Unfortunately, Kaggle's not really. We're good for sophisticated customers. Um, the way to think about us is we're capability extension, not capacity extension. So typically, our customers already have a data science team, and they're looking to bring in new techniques or get exposure to new ideas. We're not, oh, you know, we, we, we have these eight problems, and there's no one to tackle them, so we'll just toss them to Kaggle. That's not, um, it just doesn't work. With the, yeah, it's not, it's not an ideal use of us. So, Leah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you see the, the technologies changing and how that's affecting your business, if at all. You talked about social, local, and mobile mm -hmm. technologies enabling you. And now, you know, since 2008, there have been new developments. And in, in places like China, the, the so-called O2O revolution, online to offline, is really taking off. Um, are, are you learning from them? Are you learning from new technologies? How is the business evolving compared to what it was? Or are you finding that what you laid out is pretty much the same vision? Um, I think the vision is the same. I think that the technology is changing. So what I mean by that is, if I were to start a company like this today, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't start by building on a mobile platform. I'd probably look at AI platforms. I'd probably look at voice. I'd probably look at the connected home. Mm -hmm. um, and so the vision of connecting people in the real world to get real things done in real time, that hasn't changed. But I do think that there are going to be different platforms in the future mm -hmm. that are going to enable this in an even more exciting way. Is, have you looked at what's happening in China? I mean, from, some people say that they are actually leapfrogging us further ahead of the United States in terms of using this kind of connectivity and, and connecting to the crowd to mm -hmm. get a lot more tasks done. Yeah, I, I do think it's very interesting what's happening there. And, you know, we've only been able to tackle parts of Europe right now, but the Asian market is something that has been on our radar for a long time. Mm -hmm. We feel like we want to find the right partner uh, before we go there so that we can really understand what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are hyper-local in this geo-focused marketplace, it's important to have that local knowledge as well. And so do you, you add, kind of like Uber adds cities from mm -hmm. cities, is that the same sort of strategy you have where you go into a city, you don't try to go? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take another question, I guess, right uh, over here. Yeah. I have a question for Leia. Um, so what role does TaskRabbit play in uh, determining the price for services and, I guess, verticals that you mentioned that there might not be a market for currently? So, for example, like diving into a lake. <laughs> okay, great, great example. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. So our uh, business model has evolved over the course of the last eight or nine years, and um, we've taken all sorts of different approaches to pricing. Um, one thing that we're really proud of is that our taskers have been able to set what their own hourly rates are for different categories, for different services. In the beginning, that meant an auction bidding-based model, but that too, took up too much time and was too much friction. And um, when things became uh, more in real time from a consumer mindset, we had to kind of get rid of the auction model. But we still allow taskers to set their own prices up front uh, for things that are sort of off the off the ranch, off the grid, so to speak. Um, you know, we still allow taskers and clients to kind of negotiate. Maybe it's in messaging. Uh, maybe uh, the tasker charges, you know, uh, a couple hours minimum to do a job like How that. How do you get paid? What's your revenue model? So we are. It's a transaction based. We take a, a fee for every transaction that goes through the site regardless of how much or little that they... That's right. So the tasker keeps 100% of what they earn, so 100% of the hourly rate that they've established, and then the client, the demand side, pays on top of that hourly rate. To you. Okay. To our fee, yeah. What's your, what's your revenue model at, at Kaggle? Yeah, so we have uh, a few, um, um, obviously, charge for competitions. We uh, have a recruiting business, um, so uh, uh, through, bo uh, both through jobs and through... Um, Sorry, competitions to win jobs. Competitions where the prize is a job, not a prize, as well as a jobs board. Um, and actually, um, probably the biggest area of uh, growth and development for Kaggle, so we're most famous for competitions, we now have um, a cloud-based uh, workbench uh, called Kaggle Kernels and an open data platform. We have, we have sort of a, opened our aperture a lot. Um, and so uh, uh, this, the cloud-based workbench um, is currently a... Uh, so something that we allow people to use for free and they get a certain amount of compute, but uh, that will become a service that people will be able to buy you know, more compute time on. Um, and it's also the, you know, the nice connection uh, with Google. Um, as a standalone company, 
um, we had to would have had to charge a markup on top of compute. Now, as long as we're driving compute cycles for Google they, Cloud, it works very. They they charge for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. So, a question over here. Yep. I have a very uncomfortably short question. Is this all deflationary? Maybe for you. Is it deflationary? Is it driving down? Um, I think it's easy to think that, but no, I, I don't believe our marketplace is that way. I think that if you don't take care in how you've established a marketplace business like that, it's very easy um, for it to become a race to the bottom. Um, so we've been very careful about setting parameters, setting guidelines, boundaries, um, using market data to help set the right pricing. Um, Have you seen more supply or demand in your market? Is, it, is there any kind of imbalances or people looking for work out, out there through TaskRabbit, yes. or is it more that people are looking for workers or, or is yeah, it? Yeah, you know, over the course of the last decade, we've, always, we've never been supply constrained. There's always been an overwhelming amount of people that want to find access to work on the platform. Okay. So our challenge has been more on the demand side. How do we find more people that want to make those hires? Gotcha. Okay, another question. Um, I, 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 sorry, is that? Um, I, I wanted to actually follow up on your, what you said a little while ago, Anthony, about um, at Google. How has things changed since you, you got purchased? And what, you know, tell us a little bit about how Kaggle fits into the extent that you can, um, you know, what, what's happening, and, and a little bit about the vision going forward. Yeah, so, so um, first, of, first of all, it's, uh, I think we're three or four months in, so it's relatively new, but um, Google has three main centers of machine learning. There's DeepMind, which is the, the research arm out of the UK. Yep. Uh, there's Google Brain that's focused on getting, infusing all the products that we all use with, with deep learning and, and Google products. Uh, and then Kaggle's part of the uh, cloud, which is, um, uh, so we're part of, uh, those of you who know Fei Fei Lee, well-known Stanford academic, she has a new cloud machine learning organization. And this is a, a really exciting um, part of Google and it's a very good fit for Kaggle. Um, this, is, uh, this part of Google is focused on taking the technologies that are developed in, inside Google by both DeepMind and Google Brain and, having, and making them available to customers of Google Cloud. Um, and as part of making them available to customers of Google Cloud, we'll also make them available to people um, uh, working on Kaggle, whether it's competing in our machine learning competitions or doing Kaggle, using Kaggle for the variety of other things that we do. Um, and this is uh, really exciting for us. You know, when we, we spoke about the all-state competition and people use random forest and gradient boosting machines, these were techniques that you used to be able to run on your laptop, right? They were, you know, not very computationally intensive. Um, since 2012, there's been the rise of this new set of techniques, deep learning, deep neural networks, however um, you prefer to refer to them. These are extremely computationally um, uh, intensive. And so um, for us, it's really nice to be able to give our Google is building the, the, the best machine learning cloud. It's very nice to be well, able to a, give our community access. That's a real endorsement that Google is getting into using the crowd this in such a big way. Very, very exciting times. Well, we are out of time, but thanks very much to both of you, and uh, best of success to both of your ventures. Thank you very much.